Hello, welcome to this video on developmental psychology for the AQA GCSE psychology course. Uh, this video is going to focus on learning styles and more importantly the criticisms of learning styles uh, and should then conclude the course. I'll aim to do a revision video as well to, to recap everything uh, but this should cover that last couple of pages in the textbook of the course um, and hopefully um, round that off for you. So let's get into it. Um, first, learning styles. What are learning styles? So what people used to think was that there are a number of what's known as learning styles, so ways people prefer to learn. Uh, and the idea of learning styles was that if you matched what people said that they, pref the way that people said they prefer to learn with the way that they were taught, it would lead to better understanding. I mean, that is, that's kind of logical. That would make sense, wouldn't it? And I could see the appeal. I could see why people might think that that was the case. Um, so what we'll look into is what these different learning styles are, how, how they could have been adapted, uh, but the important thing to note is that the research really be led by research and what the research found was that actually this didn't have an impact um, and learning styles has, has been debunked since and you, you, you don't often find it certainly in good uh, educational institutions. Um, because there's nothing really to back it up. But I'll talk about that a bit later on. So what is a learning style then? Well, really there were three main types of learning style and there were many, many more. I'll talk about that as well. Um, but to begin with, what you've got what's known as verbalizers, visualizers or kinesthetic learners. Um, sometimes the um, verbalizers were known as auditory. So you had it um, uh, called VAC, V-A-K, um, or sometimes you put kind of read right in there. You might have heard of VARC, um, but yes, uh, learning styles are different ways of learning. So to begin with, you've got your, your verbalizers, so people who are verbalizers, they prefer uh, learning via words, they could hear it, it they could read it, um, but whatever it is, they prefer the um, verbal way of learning. So listening to lectures, listening to YouTube videos like this, uh, verbal learners would, would really like. They like repeating words, sounds over and over, they like learning lists of words, um, they like text um, and writing. So you might identify as that yourself. You might identify as really not being a verbal uh, verbalizer, not liking verbal learners. And that's where I think, again, this um, idea of learning styles was was people thought it was quite intuitive and uh, and people could identify with it. And certainly, you know, I think people have got preferred ways of uh, accessing information. Doesn't necessarily mean it leads to, to good outcomes. The next were visualizers. So visualizers uh, prefer pictures, they prefer uh, images, they prefer maps, diagrams, graphs, mind maps, things like that. Um, and what they could do is if they did here have verbal information, they wouldn't necessarily like the verbal information, they could turn this information into pictures uh, and that would help the, your visual learner. Um, and finally, we've got what would be known as a kinesthetic learner. So that's learning by doing, learning by touch, being hands-on. So rather than hearing an essay about a, a topic or, or seeing pictures on a topic, they'd much rather like to actually make a model or, or act it out or, or do something actually with it rather than just written or, or um, visually. Um, in reality, everyone's a little bit of everything and you're going to access uh, information in lots of different ways. Um, what was actually found is that, so the idea of learning styles is that you should be taught whatever it is in your preferred learning style. So if you see yourself as a visual learner, all the information that you want to learn should be visual. And, and, and you can see the appeal for that. Actually, that's not the case. That doesn't help learning. Um, and actually, there's some argument that, well, if that is your preferred style, actually, you need to learn it in other styles. You're good at that already. So you need to force yourself to, to look at things in, in other types of information, other ways. Um, and um, that, that's what, what an, another way of looking at it is that you should go against your learning style. Let's have a look then in more detail at the evaluations. So to begin with, well, let's look at a strength to begin with. There are some strengths, it's not all bad. We don't often see learning styles in, in education anymore because of the, the weaknesses that we'll go through in a moment. But what's the good point? Well, the good point is, okay, well, before learning styles came around, really, you were just looking at verbal. You were looking at written text. You were looking at philosophers back in the day. And so visual, uh, sorry, um, verbal was the only way really that, that, that people were taught and, and learned. So it's good. The strength here is that it's good to have 
other uh, methods rather than the, just the traditional method. So it's good that other learning approaches have been taken into account. It can help teachers um, to present things in different ways. It can help learners to learn things in different ways. And actually what you will generally find these days is a bit of a mixed approach. So you have different things presented in different ways or the same thing presented in different ways. Um, and that's normally best actually and, and um, can help to, to see things. You, you might not understand something when you see it written down, but you see it in a, um, in a diagram and you get it or vice versa. But actually what you'll need to be able to do is transition between all three of those different things. Um, and so the conclusion here, focus on learning styles has been helpful in general, even if the, the theory hasn't been backed up. So we'll look at that um, through the rest of the video. So the weakness then, yeah, and, and this is really important and, and quite a big weakness actually. So there's actually no support for the idea that learning styles improves performance. And so it's kind of like, well, what's the point then? What, what if, if it doesn't actually improve learning, it doesn't improve teaching, then there's there's no um, basis behind it. So um, Pachler et al, there's lots of other research out there if you want to look at it, um, have actually found no scientific evidence to support the use of learning styles. So there are some studies and some people that might believe in it, but when you look at them, they're not experimental studies, they're not rigorous, they, they might be hearsay, they might be people's ideas, preferences, um, colloquial um, casual ideas, whereas actually if you test this and use controlled methods, scientific methods, there's no impact on learning styles. When there has been that, when there has been the scientific methods, strong research has been done, what has been found is that matching teaching styles and learning styles has no impact. In fact, it's been found sometimes that it could be detrimental um, because people get too comfortable in, in the, their, in quote, preferred learning style. Um, so the research conclusion here, the research either doesn't support learning styles or actively contradicts the theory. Um, so this seriously undermines the, the theory and application of learning styles. So um, yeah, it's not, not the most supported theory. It's not the best, most rigorous uh, theory, although you can understand where it came from. And another weakness is that, okay, so we mentioned three types of learning styles there. If you look at all of the literature and all of the ways, you know, billions of people on this planet, how do most people like to like to learn? There's a number of different ways and combinations of ways. So um, Coffield et al looked at this, how many different learning styles are there? How many different combinations? And found at least 71. And so if that's true, it's absolutely impossible to match everyone's different learning style to the way that they want to learn it uh, and so it's it it's um difficult illogical impossible to to actually apply if you did try to apply the idea of teaching someone to their learning style so it's fruitless it, there's no point in identifying them because you're never going to be able to match the way that someone needs to be taught to the to, to the learning styles there compound that uh, couple that with what we just said where the research doesn't support its its um, use and performance then it, it does it's a real negative of, of this theory and so it suggests learning uh, theories are not a useful approach in in learning uh, learning style theories are not a, a useful approach in learning or teaching and so that brings me nicely on to Daniel Willingham. So Daniel Willingham is a cognitive scientist um, and he was a strong critic of learning styles. Um, so he looked at um, scientific evidence. So he was saying, okay, he's a cognitive psychologist, looked at neurology as well and said, okay, well, what do we know about how people think and how can that help development and learning? How can we link cognitive psychology and neurology um, and how can we link that to, to how people develop better? And because of that, he rejected learning styles. So as we've said, there's no research support there. So he would say, that's not a good approach. What would he say is a good approach? Well, we've already mentioned a bit when we looked at Dweck about praise. So William said, yeah, we can use praise. Obviously what we said about praise um, is quite important. It has to be quite nuanced. So don't just always praise everyone for their outcomes all the time. Actually, you need to be praising effort um, and it should be only be praising when um, deserved. So actually saying, if you do this bit of work for me, I will 
give you a reward, that actually leads to a lack of motivation. So we shouldn't do that. So what we should be doing is praising when people deserve it. It should be unexpected. So saying, okay, because you put that effort in, now here's the reward. So they're not doing it for the praise, the, the reward comes later. Um, and so only if people do they work, they get the, the praise uh, and it should lead to um, uh, better internal motivation because if people are only doing things for praise that's going to reduce their internal motivation. Willingham was also aware of memory so uh, those of you that have already looked at the memory topic for, for the GCSE you'll know that um, we know a fair bit about how human memory works and one of those things is that cues really help so retrieval cues and um, so Willingham was suggesting well actually if we try to teach and develop taking cues into account, then that can help us later on. Um, and so learning new information with the cues, you could maybe do a mind map that reminds you of a picture that, that links to the term that you've got to, to remember, that can be really helpful. Um, he's also shown that retrieval practice is important and you, you'll see lots of recent, uh, teachers doing this at the moment. So um, the act of actually recalling information can help you learn it. That sounds a bit odd because obviously you would want to recall information for an assessment. Well, not necessarily. Recalling information in in and of itself can help you um, to remember because it's the way that the information will be accessed in the future anyway. He also mentioned something else called self-regulation. Uh, so this is the ability to what's known as delay gratification, delayed gratification. So if you can say, okay, I'm going to put in time and effort, you know, your GCSEs can take you at least two years. That's going to, that's a long time before you get a, your reward of your, your really strong outcomes. Um, so those that are able to do that, those that are able to have self-regulation, so control their behavior, control their emotion, control their attention for periods of time, they tend to do a lot better. Um, and Willingham said that, that you, you should look at your self-regulation, try to hone it, try to improve it if you can. Another area that Willingham suggested was neuroscience. So this is kind of brain scans, what areas of the brain are um, active at when doing certain tasks. Brain scans can be used when it comes to looking at people with uh, neuro neurotypical um, individuals or, or those with learning um, needs, so autism, ADHD, dyslexia, things like that. And so he was saying that n neurology, neuroscience can, can potentially help in the classroom um, and could lead to early support. Okay, so let's look at evaluating Willingham then. Um, so good couple of strengths. So the first strength um, actually is that the fact that he, he is scientific. So that was part of his theory. So the point is that he did use scientific methods. Why is that a strength? Why is that a good thing? Well, it means that the theories and methods um, that are being suggested are methodologically sound. They're based in scientific understanding. Um, and so he's, he's in a good place to, to apply that. Um, and apply principles that have been found in science. And this means that the conclusions that Willingham reached um, are sound, they're likely to, to um, have some support and work. It doesn't mean they'll work directly, you know, take them out of a study and put them directly in the classroom, but with some tweaking, understanding of the context, um, a, a skilled practitioner should be able to put some of these theories into, into practice, much like, as I said, um, retrieval practice is, is used quite widely now in schools because of um, understanding of cognitive science, things cognitive load theory, there, there is um, lots of research that, that has um, supported classroom practice now. And as well as that, uh, Willingham was um, also using real world ideas. So um, this led to, um, you know, uh, things actually being used in the real world. Um, as I said, he criticised learning styles, so it doesn't lead to improved learning. Uh, but the research that William did look at um, ha can be applied, can be applied to the classroom, could be applied to um, sports and music or and whatever else it may be, uh, those different contexts. And so this is good, the fact that it can be applied because it means that there's some there's some outcome there to, to the research. So it's actually useful um, and it's, it's not just been done fruitlessly for, for someone's um, own pleasure or gratification. It's actually, we can apply these to, to different areas. It has real world uh, validity, external validity. 
but not all plain sailing. So one of one of Willingham's ideas. So looking at this neuroscience, you would then question how much can that actually be used in the classroom uh, or, or other areas. Obviously, it's there's uh, lots of machinery involved, lots of um, understanding needed to be able to interpret um, brain function, brain areas, brain scans, um, and actually being able to accurately diagnose someone uh, from a brain scan early, whether that is with ADHD or dyslexia or whatever that may be, um, can it actually um, have, a, have a, a positive impact? And, and as well as that, it's not necessarily easy to read these scans. So these different um, disorders, these learning disorders could have numerous causes, numerous ways to identify them. Um, and actually you, you may risk misdiagnosing um, learning issues if, if just relying on neuroscience. So at this stage, I would say that probably neuroscience is a bit early to be, to be able to be applicable directly. Um, and it could be misleading and detrimental to try to directly um, apply neuroscience to certainly to teaching and learning um, um, and maybe development uh, in more general terms, especially if you're not a, um, a specialist in that area. OK, I hope that was helpful and that should kind of round up the uh, developmental psychology topic. Thanks for listening.